Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another OpenShift Commons briefing. This time, we're going to get a, an overview of OpenContrail and using it with OpenShift. And we have a number of folks from Juniper um, that have great um, grateful for them um, to come and do this for us because it's something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, and it's always it's an ever-changing thing, and there's lots of new release information coming out. So James Kelly is the lead cloud architect. I'm going to let him introduce the rest of his team. There's a whole bunch of content here. Um, the way we do these sessions is ask the questions in chat. We'll try and answer them in chat. Um, the great questions you ask, we will read out loud at the end, and we'll open it up for live Q&A at the end. So without any further ado, James, take it away. Thanks very much, Diane, and thanks to everyone in the Friendly Commons community for uh, tuning in, and certainly for having us folks at Juniper and from the Open Contrail community come and talk a little bit about how OpenShift and Open Contrail work together. Um, so as you mentioned, uh, I'll introduce us uh, briefly, but uh, we will be passing the torch from myself to, to Guillaume and then to Stavi through uh, as we go, so I'll let them say a little bit more about them. But as you can see on the slide here, uh, I'm a cloud architect. I've been at Juniper for a little over 10 years now, um, you know, with software developer background, basically working on software development kits, Contrail, software-defined networking, and other projects uh, at Juniper. Uh, these days, I find myself inside of the portfolio marketing team, so I'm a little bit more of an armchair architect than uh, a hands-on architect as I was in the past, but um, nevertheless, still keep my technical chops up and uh, happy to um, have worked quite a lot with OpenShift, actually, um, since Kubernetes sort of generated a lot of interest and caught my attention, and I quickly uh, saw how... Red Hat and the OpenShift uh, community embraced that. It was something really exciting to see. And, and you know, I've actually certainly done podcasts of Open Contrail, you know, hacks with OpenShift, even dating back to beyond a year ago. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Uh, I'm going to be kicking off the talk, sort of just giving you guys a brief introduction of what to expect, um, a little bit of background about Open Contrail. And then uh, you know we'll cover the agenda a little bit more uh, on the next slide. Um, Guillaume is going to kind of take over from me and talk about the integration between OpenShift and OpenContrail. And then Savitru is going to take it from there with a live demo. So without further ado, uh, let's kind of jump in here and kind of talk about the agenda. So what to expect? Uh, today, you know, again, like I said, I'll be going through a quick introduction of Contrail, as we colloquially call uh, it for short. Um, as a project, it's Open Contrail, but we usually just say Contrail, so I'll kind of use the two interchangeably and explain the difference um, between Juniper's Contrail offering and the Open Contrail community and project. Um, Guillaume's pretty much got the second part of this, uh, the integration, the features, the installation of Contrail with OpenShift. And then, like I said, Savithru's got the live demo. And then, of course, at the end, we've put in some actual links, some URLs to where you guys can go and find out more information. And we'll see if we can get those links put into the uh, YouTube uh, video description below the video as well. So. Um, First things first, um, you know, we'll talk a little bit about Open Contrail and, and give you some background on it. So you might have heard about Open Contrail as a project. Um, it's been around since it was seeded by Juniper Networks in 2013. It's got an Apache 2 pretty permissive license. The actual software was originally written by a bunch of people uh, sort of in the networking industry as well as other folks um, from Google and so forth that kind of came together to write a software-defined network solution for you know, creating virtual networks in a more flexible, software-only way. Um, and that was done in a startup called Contrail Systems that Juniper acquired um, in 2012. And so since that time, uh, we've kind of been building and chugging along, uh, adding features to Open Contrail. And sort of the first mission of Open Contrail was to be uh, a network automation or SDN solution for OpenStack, um, which you know probably most of you in the OpenShift 
community uh, know as well. And certainly those of you um, that are familiar with Red Hat, of course, they have a, an OpenStack offering. And you know, OpenStack is pretty old now, and I guess you know, fairly quite a lot of people are familiar with Neutron and the networking side of OpenStack. Uh, and Open Contrail was really uh, the first uh, probably big popular open source uh, solution for OpenStack that was uh, not just open source, but also commercially available and quite mature and kind of ready to go uh, in production. We've seen large customers, you know, as big as AT&T, uh, many gaming companies, many large enterprises and banks adopt it. And Open Contrail is kind of known in the OpenStack community for sort of being, you know, the, the number one open source, but also commercially available uh, software-defined network solution according to you know, quite a few user surveys running now in that OpenStack community. But building on that heritage, of course, you know, we, we saw applicability for this in other use cases. So we added support for VMware over time a few years ago. And then, of course, with containers coming on the scene and Docker, and then, like I said, all of the, uh, the, the excitement and the wild success of the Kubernetes community, we said, you know, we really need to address this market as well, and it makes sense to have one solution uh, from a network perspective that can do all of these different things. And then, you know, as I said, uh, OpenShift kind of building and wrapping around Kubernetes and embracing that, um, it just is a natural extension for us to support OpenShift in Open Contrail. Uh, beyond that, Juniper, um, who you know, definitely has one of the, the commercial offerings of Open Contrail, which is formerly called Contrail Networking, if you were looking it up on Juniper.net. Um, Juniper and Red Hat have worked together for quite a long time as mutual technology alliances as well. So it really made sense for um, us to add support for OpenShift. And uh, some of the guys will talk about you know, all the specific versions and how that's happened. You know, you've seen uh, different support for OpenShift in the community of Open Contrail for you know, over a year now in sort of alpha beta experimental modes. And uh, we've recently, you know, sort of announced more formal support for it and are going through even the certification of Juniper Contrail networking with um, OCP, the OpenShift container platform from Red Hat. So we're really excited about that. Um, so. A quick word about uh, about what Open Contrail is. You know, I've said it's basically an SDN. Um, it's an SDN that's kind of opinionated in the sense that it it is only software based. It allows you to create very flexible um, networking and security constructs with pretty sensible defaults. But there is a lot of advanced SDN and customizable options in it as well. Um, obviously having worked with big customers over a long time and years of development now from hundreds of engineers. Um, and really, you know, in the space of, of OpenShift, I guess you could kind of generalize it to, to a few things. I mean, you know, this is, you know, really general, but saying that it, it adds multi-tenancy support um, at the network level, as well as micro-segmentation support at the network level. And, you know, these are probably terms that you've heard of, both in the OpenShift community and certainly in the Kubernetes community. I know micro-segmentation or the ability to do sort of custom network isolation is, is sort of top of mind right now because I know Kubernetes 1.7 was just released and network policy objects were actually uh, incubating for quite a while, but now generally available. And that's something that Open Contrail adds, amongst other things. So going along to my next slide, um, we kind of position Open Contrail as sort of, you know, like the Lord of the Rings, one ring to rule them all, the one SDN to rule them all. Uh, we know that with OpenShift, just like, you know, other orchestration systems, you have a choice of which SDN you use. And there are definitely a lot of other contenders in the space of software-defined networking projects, both closed and open source. Um, some companies even having many um, that they'll offer. Juniper certainly only has one. And our philosophy is um, not to try to necessarily build different best tools for the job, because that kind of leads to a lot of variability uh, in your stack. 
and you know harder to maintain, harder to you know level up skill sets and so forth for network ops people, but rather to have this this one tool that allows you to address uh, many different things. So like I was saying, over time we've added support for various flavors of virtual machines, uh, Linux bare metal, as well as container runtimes. Uh, certainly today we're talking about container as a service, platform as a service, um, with support for Kubernetes, Mesos, and OpenShift, um, and other custom container orchestration systems that people have uh, invented and talked about on the Open Control blog. And then um, I've already talked about how if you're building a cloud and an infrastructure as a service, you know, OpenStack is probably one of the things that comes to mind there, and Open Control works in that space. Um, but Open Control also works on top of many infrastructure as a services. So if you're running OpenShift atop of OpenStack, or if you're running OpenShift on top of Amazon uh, Web Services, or the Google Cloud, or really anywhere, um, as long as there's IP connectivity between all of the different hosts, um, Open Control can work. So a little bit more of an overview in terms of, you know, we've talked about this top level uh, of the different environments that Contrail supports. Um, many of these uh, on the left-hand side at the top are more enterprise related, but then, you know, you see things like Amdocs, which gets into the uh, telecommunications, cable communications service provider market where they have operational and business support systems uh, from companies like Amdocs, and there's, you know, integrations there. But a, a wide variety of services, like I said, that have matured over many years of development. Um, fundamentally, layer two and layer three virtual networking constructs where you can really um, bring your own IP addresses. Uh, you know, as the next thing says, right, the, the DDIF, as we sort of call it for short, or DNS, DHCP, IPAM, IP address management, and floating IP addresses, um, quality of service, custom security policy, Load balancing, which is obviously something kind of top of mind for microservice architectures for this audience, uh, and, and a wide variety of other things, but certainly a northbound API and a web GUI um, as well is part of Contrail. Um, we'll talk about the architecture on the next slide at a very high level, but um, one of the biases that you have in Contrail in terms of it being able to work with other systems, it obviously needs to work with other networking systems. Uh, at Juniper, those would all be based on Junos. You know, they'd be based on various operating systems that other vendors like Cisco, Arista, Cumulus, and others um, that we've tested interoperability and federating from a network standpoint with. And we do that with open standards, um, long-lived and proven network protocols. Uh, so our overlays are based on MPLS over some IP protocol like GRE or or UDP and our federation protocols for the control plane are based on BGP, which has been used for network virtualization across the internet for uh, over a decade and a half now, I think. And it connects everything, right, from um, how it will connect with the vRouter agent to containers, bare metal, and VMs, to other bare metal systems that might actually live behind routers or top of rack switches as well. So this might make sense a little bit more seeing um, how Contrail is implemented from uh, a logical architecture diagram of building blocks and sort of a logical view of what it allows you to do of uh, create these flexible network constructs on the, the right-hand side, right? You create a blue virtual network, create a green virtual network, or whatever you want to call them. They have various workloads in. They can have, you know, um, overlapping IP address spaces or their own customizable address spaces. And normally networks, are, if you call them virtual networks, are probably isolated, but policy allows them to be connected together. We can even connect them together with interesting um, services in between them that may be physical or virtual, such as firewalls as a common example. And then the left-hand side of the diagram is sort of saying, you know, we have centralized policy definition and distributed enforcement of that policy. And if you wanted to parse Contrail, at the highest level, you could probably say that it's really two components, right? It's a logically centralized controller, that box in the middle, and then a distributed agent that we call the vRouter or virtual router, right? And that pretty much runs on all of the compute nodes, whatever they may be and uh, whatever kind of workloads they're running. And then we build some overlay which can exist over top of any network whether it's a network like the AWS network or a physical 
um, IP or Ethernet network, whatever it happens to be. And um, of course, all of the vRouters sort of connect up. You see it using XMPP here in the slide to the controller. The controller can federate with other controllers. The controller can also federate with actual network devices, whether they be physical or virtual, layer two or layer three network devices. Um, a common example is, of course, to talk out over the um, internet or outside of the overlay through a gateway or through a wide area network. And at the very top end, you see it's got a RESTful API that plugs into many different kinds of orchestration systems, OpenShift included. So with that quick overview of Contrail, let's talk about how uh, Contrail and OpenShift work together. And I'll hand the, the talking stick over to Guillaume now. Thank you, James, for uh, the introduction and uh, laying out uh, the architecture and the, the different use cases uh, of Contrail. So my name is Guillaume Tesser. I'm a solution engineer. I've been with um, Juniper for about two years now working in the Contrail business unit, um, mainly with either telcos or large enterprises on how Contrail, explaining how Contrail works and trying to solve very different issues through um, SDN and working across different types of virtualization and lately mainly around containers runtimes, especially with Kubernetes and OpenShift. So let's jump right in and look at how we integrate with um, with OpenShift. So just you know to put Contrail on the map, I think that's pretty obvious. But you know when you look at uh, the stack that I guess most of you guys are familiar with, um, we basically sit at the networking layer and we will replace the native OpenShift SDN solution that comes with the traditional, I would say, op uh, OpenShift uh, stack. So <clears throat> that being said, let's look at how we. Um, plug all that together. So I guess you guys are familiar with, uh, you know, their Kubernetes architecture. Um, you have your master, you know, different nodes, uh, the different components of a Kubernetes master, the API server, the um, replication controller, the schedulers, etc. cetera. Um, what we do basically is that we have um, implemented um, a sort of plugin that we call the Control Cube Manager that basically listens um, to, on the, listens to the API server and based on the events it sees there, will then create the appropriate objects on the Contrail side. So <clears throat> a little bit in the same fashion, but you know, the kubelet watches the API and then will update its configuration. If it sees that the resource is being created, then we pretty much do the same thing on our, on our hand, watching the API server, creating the appropriate objects in Contrail, and then updating the configuration of the vRouter accordingly. So that's what happens from a control plane perspective. So we integrate in the in the background. It's totally transparent, actually. So basically, the, from the user perspective, the workflow stays the same. So you still create your pod services, your deployments in the same fashion. And it's just that Contrail would pick up these events and then implement the network configuration in the back in the background. Uh, from a data plane perspective. So, you know, James laid out the architecture with the control plane and the distributed data plane. So from a data plane perspective, we have our component that we call the vRouter that basically installs on the different compute nodes and will replace the kube proxy part. So we, so we were basically substituted to it because we implement our own uh, uh, rules and policies there, and we integrate with the kubelet through the CNI plugin. So then when uh, the kubelet will need to instantiate pods on a, on a certain node, it will call out through the CNI plugin to the vRouter to provide the networking configuration, and the vRouter will have had received its configuration from the controllers who you know, would have been triggered by the creation of uh, an object in the system basically through the contract cube manager. Okay, so that's, that's basically how we integrate. Same behavior as far as Contrail is concerned, just one more component, this cube manager that listens to the API and trigger the configuration on the Contrail side. So just to give you a view of the, the mapping of the main primitives in Kubernetes to what they map into um, Contrail objects, because some people are familiar with Contrail in an open stack uh, environment, so basically the namespace would map into Contrail into a project. So we, every time you have a namespace, and we'll all see that in the, the next slides, but you want to isolate it, for example, then you would create specific projects in which you will have virtual network, et cetera. The pod concept relates to, you know, from a contract perspective, again, not from a conceptual perspective, but uh, to a virtual machine. 
the service equals to an ECMP load balancer, meaning what I mean by that is that every time somebody will actually create a service in OpenShift, that will result in the creation of an ECMP load balancer to access the, the pods that are instati instantiated in the infrastructure. Um, as far as ingress is concerned, we have our own implementation which relies on a HA proxy load balancer, and we'll touch on that in the next coming slides. And we also integrate with uh, the network policy uh, object. So basically, every time somebody creates a network policy, uh, we actually implement security groups in the back end to allow communication or not between the pods, the different pods and the services. So we'll see that actually through the demo. Uh, that we support uh, this type of implementation. So looking at the different features, so James mentioned in the introduction that we bring to the table some different type of isolation. So we obviously support, you know, default um, mode that, you know, known as a cluster mode where basically you have one large virtual network, uh, you know, fetching IP addresses from two different IPAMs, pod IPAM and service IPAM, and <clears throat> basically we implement all the overlay networking to allow the pods to talk to each other, the services to be exposed externally, to be reached out uh, from outside of uh, the cluster. So this is um, all supported. What we also, um, what we implemented on top of it is this concept of namespace isolation. So basically when you create your namespace, you can just by um, defining an annotation in the namespace declaration, trigger on control side the creation of a separate project and a separate virtual network. So what it does is that it basically isolates all your pods and services that belong to this namespace, and then you can control uh, based on the virtual network who you want to talk to who. So that gives you flexibility uh, inside your namespace. You can still apply network policies inside the namespace, et cetera, but then also be between your namespaces and between the resources inside the namespace, uh, you can control all that by using uh, control networking policies. Okay, so that's basically the two main modes, I would say, so default and uh, namespace isolation. So if we look at the how we get as a as a user, um, it's very flexible because on top of it, as it was mentioned, we have this mode we call custom isolation, basically. So that 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 can be seen in different use cases where uh, you want to break down your application to different networking, so to different types of networks, so you can create networks in Contrail then and then you know, um, spin up your pods on specific virtual networks. But there is also a um, specific use case, for example, when it comes with integrated with um, OpenStack, for example. So you actually um, would create uh, virtual machines spinned up on specific virtual network, and then pods, let's say you have an application that has a front end in containers and a back end that sits in a VM that runs on OpenStack, you still, can create the networking between these um, this, this two, two layers uh, by using this custom isolation, because you can actually specify where you want to run your front end, and that ties directly with the networking from your virtual, virtual machine environment. So that's actually pretty nice, and it gives you the flexibility across the whole stack of either you know, allowing communication between the elements, isolating them into namespaces, allowing them to talk with external resources. Um, so that's that's pretty neat, and that's the isolation uh, features that we bring to the table. Um, just wanted to remind that, so every time we, we do that, we provide ECMP load balancing between uh, all the pods. So this uh, load balancing concept is totally software defined and automated. Uh, we provide all the security policies that go with it. We also provide um, external access, either via SNAT, and we'll see that in the, in the live demo, or via the allocation of floating IPs. And um, as we mentioned, you know, we have the integration from the control plane to external gateways using protocols like BGP. So all the, all the virtual networking configuration that you would do in your cluster can be directly and automatically uh, announced and I mean, all the prefixes can be advertised and uh, propagated using BGP to VRFs and stitch them to MPS VPN, for example. Uh, to get out of uh, the cluster, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So that was for isolation. Um, just quickly on ingress, you know, I guess most of you guys are familiar with the concept of uh, ingress in uh, OpenShift, basically exposing services to the outside world and being able to route traffic 
two different services. So basically two different parts of your application being able, based on the URL or the host name or things like that, to actually direct traffic towards services that then in the back end uh, serve their purpose through their pod. So already explained that service for us is a CMP load balancer. And in front of a service, we can have an ingress that basically every time you create one object of that type, we spin up two instances of HA proxy, one active, one backup. And uh, these instances of HA proxy will get auto configured with um, the, the policy, the routing policy that you, uh, you you put in place, and we'll see that in the demo. Typically here, and that's the example we'll see, you'll get a slash dev uh, environment and a slash QA environment. So you have two applications um, served by two different services, and based on the URL, this uh, HA proxy uh, load balancer will basically route the traffic toward the, the respective services. Okay. So one uh, last feature I wanted to talk about is the <clears throat> this concept of nesting installation. Uh, so basically, we support uh, using OpenStack as an infrastructure as a service software to spin up virtual machine in which you'll be able to create Kubernetes cluster, OpenShift cluster, um, etc. So the idea here is really to have one SDN controller for both layers, for virtual machines and for the containers. So just going through this uh, this, this uh, diagram, um, you know, we use uh, OpenStack and Contrail to provide the VMs to install OpenShift. So that, from Contrail networking perspective, creates you know traditional virtual network, uh, on our vRouter plugs tap interfaces toward these virtual machines. Then we'll use these virtual machines to install OpenShift. So then you know you find all your different components. I just represented the you know, Kubernetes component, but you, know, you get you get the idea with the main, uh, main different components of the controller. Um, then let's say we create a virtual network that we call Green in that case to connect uh, OpenStack and OpenShift workload. So when we spin up a virtual machine, that's traditional control networking, plug a tap interface in, uh, create a VRF. Um, so this uh, virtual machine in this Green network get associated with this VRF, so it gets it's its own and proper routing context, basically being able to reach anything else on this same virtual network. Then what happens when we launch a pod, and that's where, uh, for example, we can use this custom isolation that I was talking about. We would say in the, the declaration of the application or the declaration of a namespace in which we run our application that we want to associate that with a specific virtual network that has been created in Contrail, and in this case, that's a virtual network where you have OpenStack VM sitting. And so basically what we do is that we um, we use the same interfaces, the same interface toward the virtual machine, but then we use Mac VLAN to actually se separate the traffic toward the different pods. So you get this um, implementation where you have VLANs basically on top of these interfaces, and it allows you to connect workloads from different type of uh, hypervisors across different cluster potentially. Okay, so that's how we basically power this interconnection between VMs and pods using a combination of overlay networks and sub interfaces with MacVLAN. Okay, and so you can replicate that as many times as you want and have over virtual machines, over pods, different virtual network allow communication between these virtual network or not, uh, apply different type of policies on them, etc. So that's what I wanted to highlight in terms of feature. So if I recap all the isolation features, the CMP load balancing, the ingress implementation, and the support of a nested installation of a container cluster on top of virtual machine provided by OpenStack. So now you might be wondering, okay, so how do I install Contrail with, uh, with OpenShift? So there is different options and there is still work in progress. So everything on this slide is not necessarily 100% available right now, but I wanted to mention it, and most of it is going to be available very, very soon. So as James mentioned in the introduction, we're working on a certification with OpenShift, so that is actually targeted for our next release, Port Auto.1, that should come, um, I guess, beginning of September or so. So then we would be directly integrated with OpenShift Ansible, so that will give you a, w a way to deploy at the same time OpenShift and Contrail together. Um, as of now, to deploy Contrail in a container environment, we actually have an Ansible playbook. 
So I pointed out in the links at the end the Sensible Playbook, so you can go check it out, and uh, you, you can use it to deploy Contrail with OpenShift, Kubernetes, for example. We're working on Helm charts, actually. So we, we already have Helm charts to deploy Contrail, but they're not like yet 100% bulletproof and tested. So they will be supported officially in one of the future releases, but just so you know and keep it in the radar, we actually will have an implementation to deploy Helm charts. And again, uh, there is a Contrail-Docker repo on GitHub. It has the Helm charts, you can go check them out. Um, so one thing that we did with the Contrail 4.0 release, so which came out a couple months ago, that we actually containerized the whole Contrail software. Um, so the idea, so if you've been following Open Contrail, we've been posting packages up to 2.2 versions. Uh, and then for free, .x, there was no official packages on the PPA. You can, the, the, the source code is always available, and one can always go and build it. But basically, the idea with a containerization to take advantage of it would be to make this container publicly available right off the CI environment. So right now, we're actually reworking the tooling of our CI environment. Uh, so very soon, we'll make available the containers directly out of CI so that people can consume them directly and then deploy them in their environment of choice. And with that, I'll just give you guys an introduction on the demo that uh, Savit Fru is going to unfold. Um, so giving you the main you know, features that are going to be shown, and then I'll let I know Savit Fru comment through as he's uh, unfolding the demo. But basically, here is the setup. We have uh, Contrail running with OpenShift. <coughs> we have a like standard namespace in OpenShift context called Juniper namespace. Uh, and we're going to spin up some pods. So first, it's not really presented in the demo, but that's you know you'll get the ID, and that's basically what happens every time you know the pod gets created. But if you give a pod, it's going to be pod and services are going to be created. Uh, we're going to associate external IP. So in this case, we'll do um, uh, we'll we'll do it for ingress. But I'm just giving you the the workflow and basically what it implies on the control side. Um, every time we do that type, that type of operation, is that basically when we associate the external IP, we would create a floating IP that then gets advertised automatically using BGP to the gateway. So that's what I was explaining earlier, where, earlier when we take advantage of uh, uh, basically, you know, MPLS VPN concepts and advertising these prefixes through BGP uh, that will give access uh, from the external world to the resources that are on the cluster. And then let's say your application scales up, you change the number of replicas, automatically the service is implemented as an ECMP load balancer, so you, you would load balance your traffic between the different pods. So that's you know one uh, thing, and you'll see that happening in the background when the services are gonna, are gonna be created. Um, we, we'll show namespace isolation by basically creating a namespace in which we'll um, say that we want the isolation to be effective, and so to isolate the pods and the services inside this namespace. Basically creating this pod, we'll see that the communication between the you know, non-isolated namespace and the isolated namespace will not be possible. On the other hand, pod schedule in this isolated namespace will have you know, a communication inside the namespace that's going to be just fine. Then from this namespace, we'll uh, show the SNAT feature, so basically allowing this pod to access or allowing your application to access uh, internet, for example, through fetch resources, and we'll finish with a fan out ingress example. So a little bit like I was explaining in the slide with two different type of services with URL routing um, definitions, and then depending which one we're actually querying, Q environment and dev, will be then redirected to the services, and each of the services will then load balance the request toward the, the pods in the back end. Okay, so that's all I had with uh, the integration, regarding the integration with OpenShift, the different features, the installation, and now I'll hand it over to Savit Fru for a live demo. Thank you, guys. Hey, uh, guys, I'm just gonna interrupt for a sec. For those of you um, who are asking all the questions in chat, I'm gonna ask the presenters who are not giving a live demo, take a look in the chat. Um, and see if you can answer some of the questions there while the live demo is going on. Sure. 
Hey guys, uh, this is Savitru. Uh, I'm from the Juniper BU, uh, working in the same team as Game and James. So thanks, Game, for that detailed information. Uh, I'll quickly jump over to the demo and uh, probably give you an uh, overview about how exactly Contrail integrates with OpenShift. So uh, this is my Contrail web UI, uh, and also this is the OpenShift web UI. Uh, initially, when we provision Contrail, uh, we create two uh, IPAMs, mainly uh, the service IPAM and the pod IPAM. So the pod IPAM is a large subnet, uh, it's a slash 12 subnet, and the pods, whenever a pod is launched, it's spent uh, in this particular uh, subnet. Whenever a service is launched, then it, uh, the services come up on this uh, 1096.00 slash 12 subnet. And uh, these IPAMs are associated with uh, one network, which is called the cluster network. Uh, so right now, uh, these are the number of different projects I have in Contrail, which maps to uh, different namespaces in uh, OpenShift. So the first lab demo is about uh, namespace isolation. Uh, let's quickly jump and create two new namespaces. Uh, I have... Uh, two namespaces, one which is an isolated namespace and the other one a non-isolated namespace. Uh, so the whole idea here is to uh, create these namespaces, launch uh, two pods in each of these namespaces, and then uh, try to ping between them and verify that you know the ping doesn't go through. So by default, OpenShift doesn't provide any isolation. Uh, this is the value add that Contrail brings in and how we go about creating a uh, isolated namespace is uh, we have this annotation and whenever this annotation which says isolation is equal to true then we attach relevant security groups to the virtual network and that's how we isolate uh, that namespace from the rest of the world so let's go and create uh, this namespace And in the non-isolated namespace, I have uh, isolation set to false. So, so these are my two new namespaces, the isolated and the non-isolated. Uh, as you can see, this is replicated in the UIs. So whenever we create an isolated namespace, a new virtual network is created. Uh, the reason why we do it is uh, we, we want all the pods, we don't want all the pods to present in this isolated namespace to talk uh, to other pods present in non-isolated namespace. And that's when we create a security group and we say uh, pods within this namespace can communicate amongst themselves and you know deny all for the rest of the pods. So let's see how it how it works and uh, Let's jump into uh, one of the isolated namespaces. And let's create a pod. I have a simple Ubuntu application. Uh, and let's also create a, a pod in uh, the non-isolated namespace. So I'll open another tab for the isolated. So as Game mentioned uh, in his briefing, uh, whenever a pod is created, we map it to a virtual machine interface. And this is the port which is attached to the pod. As you can see in the isolated namespace, we have this Ubuntu application, which gets an IP of uh, 255.251. And the network is an isolated. And similarly, if we go back to uh, the non-isolated namespace, uh, we see that the pod got an IP from the cluster network, uh, which is 255.249. And here, if you see the security groups, 
there's no isolation at all. Uh, we allow traffic, ingress traffic to come from all all particular uh, IPs. So now that these uh, parts have come up, so I'll pick this IP address of uh, the part present in the non-isolated namespace, uh, which is 249, and uh, the part which is present in the isolated namespace, which is 251. So let's go ahead and ping uh, this dot .251, which is present in the isolated namespace from the part uh, pre present in the non-isolated namespace. So this guy has an IP of 10.47.2.249 and uh, I'm going to ping 10.47.255.251 which is the part IP of the isolated uh, part. And as you can see, uh, the traffic doesn't go through. And this shows so that you know we have isolated the part from the rest of uh, the cluster network. So this is the uh, demo of the isolated namespace. Uh, now let's go ahead and uh, uh, create a source NAT functionality where we allow uh, internet access to all of these parts. So by default, uh, you know, these parts cannot access the internet because we believe that, you know, the parts are uh, pre-built packages and they don't need to access the internet. So we, we thought, you know, this would be a security functionality that we can uh, enhance and hence we don't allow uh, internet access by default. So let's try to ping uh, Google's DNS server. And right now, uh, as you can see, the ping doesn't go through. And to allow access to the internet, we create a router object. And uh, the way we do it is uh, we go into default, and then there is this router tab present in Contrail UI. And uh, let's just create this. Uh, let's call this, uh, router example and then we have an external gateway network which is our publicly facing network and let's select that virtual network and let's connect the cluster network to public network so whatever part comes up on this cluster network we'll use this public network to get out of the internet so once this router object is created uh, now if we go back to the pod and ping again Now we see that the part can reach out to the internet. So this way, we actually uh, source NAT. So basically, whatever uh, IP is present on the cluster network, we NAT it to the IP present on the uh, public network, and we reach out to the internet. And that can also be verified uh, in the ports tab of uh, uh, the non-isolated network. So basically, this IP uses uh, uh, a floating IP from the cluster network in order to get out of the internet. As you can see, this is the, uh, this is the IP that it uses, the SNAT IP. So now we have shown namespace isolation and we also shown uh, SNAT. So let's go ahead and create uh, ingress types. So basically uh, in ingress types, I'm going to show you name-based ingress and also simple fan out ingress. So uh, let's go to the non-isolated uh, namespace. I'm on non-isolated namespace. And let me create a, a part in uh, dev and QA namespaces, basically. And uh, what I have in dev is uh, basically an application, uh, which just a front-end application which says dev. And uh, I similar, similarly, I have a, a web app QA application uh, which displays QA in the front end. So let's go ahead and create this uh, part. So now that the parts are created, let's go ahead and create a service. So what I have here is uh, basically a service called as a web dev, which forwards the traffic coming on port 80 to the parts uh, which are present in the backend. 
So service is responsible for uh, ECMP load balancing to the respective backend parts. So as you can see, I now have uh, three web app dev parts and three web app QA parts and their respective services, dev and QA. And similarly, in the contrail web UI, if you go to the ports, we see that you know there are a number of uh, VM virtual machine interfaces created, uh, three for the dev parts and three for the QA parts, and we also have two for the uh, services. And the way we differentiate uh, the services from uh, the parts is through this device type, which is the k load balancer. So these IPs dot one fifty five and dot fifteen are actually the service IPs. So let's go ahead and create the ingress type right now. So in the name-based ingress, sorry, I'll show you the fan-based ingress first. So in the fan-based ingress, we have uh, uh, the rules here, where we say slash dev, uh, go to web app uh, dev, and slash QA, go to web app QA service. Uh, let's go ahead and create this now. As you can see, the ingress type has been created. Describe ing. And slash dev points to web app dev listening on port 80. Slash QA points to web app QA listening on port 80. And now in the contrail vRouter agent, which is running on the OpenShift node, uh, if you see the HA proxy rules that we push in. We created a new rule for this uh, finite based ingress. So Contrail automatically pushes this uh, rules in the backend on the agent node. So that whenever a traffic comes on uh, the ingress IP, it automatically forwards this to either you know the service dev or the service QA uh, parts respectively. And uh, in the uh, Contrail web UI, if I refresh the screen, then I have a, a public facing IP for the fan out ingress, which is 1084.31.53, which comes from a public virtual network. And uh, on opening on the UI, if I put that IP slash dev, uh, it should take me to the dev uh, part. And as you can see, the IP address is 246, which is one of the backend dev parts. On hitting refresh, you know, it takes me to a different IP, which shows that you know ECMP load balancing is working in the backend. Uh, so slash QA should take me to the QA part, uh, which it does. And uh, the IP address is 242. And on refresh, you know, it takes me to a different part, 244. So this shows us uh, uh, the simple find out English type. And there's also one more uh, English type which I would like to show, and that is uh, name-based ingress, where we uh, pass the host name and the header field, and that's how we basically differentiate where to go, which backend service to use. So in this, I have, uh, I pass this host called dev.com and qa.com. So whenever the header matches uh, either one of these uh, host types, then it goes to the different backend services present here. So now, uh, there's a new rule which has been created uh, for the HA proxy load balancing. And uh, in the Contrail Web UI, if I refresh the screen, I should see another IP, which is 1084.31.54 for the name-based ingress. And now, if I just enter this, then it should throw me an error, which it does, because I haven't passed the uh, host information, the header information. So I use this tool to pass the header information. And when I pass uh, host equal to dev.com, 
and I hit refresh, it should take me to one of the dev pods. And this is the same ECMP load balancing which occurs in the backend. And when I hit uh, QA.com, it should take me one of the QA pods. So this shows us, you know, the uh, by passing the host information in the header, it directs us to different pods. And Contrail does it seamlessly in the backend. So this is the demo that I've got uh, uh, in terms of namespace isolation, ingress types, and source NAT. And Contrail does offer, uh, you know, a rich analytics as well. So you can see the different uh, uh, node types here. So this is one of the nodes that I have where I actually launched the uh, workload, the pod workloads. And uh, this is my uh, control node. So there's a lot of in interesting information here that you can grab, like how much traffic is coming to each of these pods, the CPU utilization on the nodes and stuff like that. So you would never require a third party, uh, you know, a monitoring tool in order to uh, capture all this information. Our analytics components does this for you. So this is where we bring the value add in uh, portion of the control. And uh, yes, that's it. Uh, so thank you for watching, and I'll hand it over to James. Yeah, do you want to go back to the slides then? Yeah. This is, uh, we're, we're slowly running down on time here, and there have been a, a number of questions in, um, in the chat that we've been busily answering. So, uh, yeah, this is yeah this is do you want to you want to answer some of them live on yeah the, can you uh, yeah sorry sorry Diane I was trying to catch up you know and going you know, through each of them at a time but you know writing and reading the, the new responses etc so to to leave question about the like how to basically uh, spend the same network across different clusters so you know I was talking about. Uh, you know, running uh, OpenStack on top of Kubernetes, OpenShift, or running um, Open, you know, OpenStack on top of it, or running OpenShift Kubernetes inside of OpenStack, etc. So that, those I already answered and explained. One thing I was, you know, about to write is also uh, if we consider different clusters, like we have a way to kind of federate networks across different clusters, but we use different controllers. That's also an option. You know, basically, since we sync our controllers using BGP, uh, you can have different virtual networks and, you know, exchange uh, networking information in each of a cluster based on, you know, basically importing port of route targets and uh, this kind of stuff. So that also gives you an option to basically stretch across different clusters. Just thinking about it, but then there's, there might be other options and, you know, that require a little bit of uh, thinking to answer totally that question. Um, I think there was another question. So Ali's question was, uh, 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 there was, um, yeah, there was a, a lot of, so I, I answered on the open contrail vs. contrail. Uh, then there was a question about the advantages over SDN solutions like Big Switch, Nuage, Cisco. Um, there is, I mean, there is multiple answers to it. Like some are, more like fabric oriented, some are more are based on overlay, uh, some are directly in the underlay. I mean, there is there is a lot of uh, differences, so it would require like a one to one comparison pr pretty much. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to add things on that, but yeah, I mean, so, going back to what I said at the beginning, I mean, the fact that it's open source, that it, it's not a niche solution just for containers, like. You know, if you look at something like maybe Calico or Conti, mm -hmm. they tend to be, you know, mostly for containers. The other thing is, you know, if you talk to NetOps people, eventually, you know, they will have some sort of say um, in the the DevOps stack in, in the OpenShift cluster, right? Because you need to connect to other things. Uh, at that point, you know, at one one tool to rule them all, like it, so they don't have to learn something new, is also really helpful. And then you know when you get to this sort of cliff of where you can't do something with these more niche, less mature solutions, um, yeah, sure they're lighter weight, but then you get to some point where you can't do something right. Contrails, you know, quite mature, very um, rich in the feature set. And like I said, you know, I think there's sensible defaults where it's it's approachable and easy to use, but then when you need to do something sophisticated, chances are there's probably, you know, somebody that's thought of that before. Um, we have some tough networking customers, so 
So that's something um, to think about as well. The analytics that uh, Savvy through pointed out is, is another thing, right? Yeah, analytics is something that is in general you know, kind of it's kind of an afterthought, or but our analytics API is actually I mean, pretty rich and uh, gives a lot of visibility on the operating states of your network. Uh, so that's something we like to point out as a differentiator as well, is all the information you can basically extract from our analytics and then you can integrate it into your monitoring or troubleshooting tools as a customer. So that's, that's a, a big difference. There's some um, more questions. There was some more question. There was two more. I mean, I can see two more questions. There was one question from George and asking about what if like you run OpenStack with Neutron and uh, OpenShift with OpenContrail. Uh, so in that case, like, but they are consider you have two networking domains basically in that case like you know either we integrate with neutron as an as a neutron plugin and then use control with openstack but if you use plain vanilla neutron then and use open control with openshift on the other hand and you want to have somehow some kind of synchronization in terms of networking then you will have to go through a gateway or exchange routing uh, information you don't have like direct integration in that sense you know like what I meant when I explained the nested mode was that basically you use you know, the Neutron plugin points to Contra API and the CNI plugin uses Contra as well in that case. That's, and there is another question from Ali about uh, how to handle high availability and service recovery. So basically Contra is designed uh, in a fashion that it, all the services can scale out basically. So, you know, our API, um, the different components of our solution, you know, you know there is RabbitMQ or Redis, Kafka, etc. They, they can basically scale out and what we do in general in front of it, so we have, you know, load balancer in front of it to load balance all the requests and uh, in the back end, the database is a NoSQL database that is clustered across different nodes to basically ensure that if you know one node comes to fail or one process actually on one node comes to fail, then the other processes can take over the the, the load and the work. Uh, there is just a couple processes that are very specific that are more in an active backup backup kind of a thing, but otherwise it's all active active. And we support a two n plus one model of failure where n basically is the number of failure. So story rate one failure, we have three controllers, these three controllers handle the whole high availability and failover. So do, yeah. do, you, do you need to do anything special um, in terms of um, setting it up high availability and service recovery with Contrail on OpenShift or is that just comes out of the box because of Contrail's design and architecture? Yeah. So in turn, out of the box you will get the um, all the load balancing, I mean, the, all the high availability between the services, but most likely you'll have to put a, like a load balancing in front of it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that, that's it. Otherwise, in terms of design, the solution itself, if you have multiple uh, controllers, then you know they will handle the HA themselves. Yeah, it's more from a failover of a load balancer in front of it. Most most customers, they so we have customers they still have their like hardware load balancer solution that they use for their clusters, so they put that in front and they use it to uh, access different resources in their cluster. And they point to Contrail in that case. Um, we have some people that use software load balancers. Um, yeah, there's different options there. But you're talking about in front of the Contrail service. Oh, Contrail, the yeah. Contrail APIs. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that kind of goes back to, um, you know, the different installation modes that we talked about too and how it kind of differentiates us versus some of the competitors actually as well. Um, you know, Contrail does support in-service software upgrades, so you can go between one version of Contrail and another uh, within an OpenShift cluster with no downtime. That, that, and that's pretty huge, you know, so, um, and, but it also sounds like with all these questions, there's at least one other Open Contrail briefing that we could do, um, um, obviously, and to drill down into some of these questions. So, um, we, we have come to the end of our hours, so I want to respect people's times. And um, what, what I'll try and do is I'll, I'll capture the, the questions here and maybe I'll share them with the speakers and if, you, if there's more links or things that you want to share. When I publish this as the blog got op on the a video in the blog got on openshift.com, um, we can add those um, links and other further details in along with the blog articles and links that are here. So I really want to thank you guys for your time today and for everybody for your great questions. This is obviously a big hot topic and um, 
So I, you know, sometimes you never know what um, everybody's going to ask great questions on, and these have been really good questions, um, and it was a wonderful presentation. So um, it, this may be one of those YouTube videos that people watch all the way through the end. We'll find out later. Um, and so thanks, guys, for, for doing this, and um, we'll, we'll look forward to another one soon. Thanks very much, Diane. Thanks to everybody. Thanks, Diane. Thank you guys. Have a good rest of your day.